morning, everybody. Uh, what else you? Once more, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Unfortunately, I am introducing you in these meetings just by Zoom and not in person. It is, um, I think, the second time that I'm, they have the honor to be the chair of your uh, talk. And uh, in order to start this last day of this uh, long meeting in honor of uh, Olga Alexandrova Lenzinskaya, it's my great honor to introduce Alessi Figali that will speak on generic regularity in optical problem. Please, Alessi, you oh, have- Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it will be nice eventually to have <laughs> a situation where we're both present, but uh, given the circumstances, unfortunately, during the last years, we didn't have chances, but hopefully in the future. And uh, so it's uh, also for me a great pleasure and honor to speak in this conference. In honor of Vladiskaya. And um, so today I would like to talk about a problem on which I've been working on in the last uh, five years, roughly, which is obstacle problems. So, uh, obstacle problems are a topic which is like, it's very classical. So, let me explain to you what is the elliptic obstacle problem. So, in the obstacle problem, you have a PDE, which is simply the Laplace equation of you. Being the Laplace of u, the Laplacian of u, being equal to characteristic of u positive. So you just have a, a function u which is non-negative, and where u is zero, there is nothing to say, and where u is positive, we say that the Laplacian is equal to one. Let's say um, this very simple PDE, you see, uh, is uh, what we call the free boundary problem. I mean, a, a PDE with free boundaries because the set u equal zero is an unknown of the problem. Still, it's a boundary in the problem because on u equals zero, there are extra boundary conditions. So what is this extra boundary condition? This is in the picture that I drew. You see there is this extra condition on the boundary, grad u equals zero. So this is simply due to the fact that so because the Laplacian of u is the characteristic of u positive, the Laplacian of u is bounded. And so the Laplacian u bounded implies u being at least C1. And so if you have a C1 function, which is non-negative, automatically its gradient will be zero, where u is zero. Um, and so this means that the solution to the obstacle problem satisfies both Dishley and Neumann boundary conditions on the free boundary, which is the, this interface where u changes from zero to positive. So you have, we have this extra condition of zero gradient, which makes this an overdetermined over PD problem, and this overdetermination is what forces the geometry of the free boundary. So not every set can be the boundary of such a PD, can be the interface of such a PD. Uh, so why do we call it the obstacle problem? Because this is simply the Euler Lagrange equation of the following function. You just take the integral over omega of grad V square plus V uh, with fixed boundary conditions on the boundary. So let's say F on the boundary but with the constraint v greater or equal than zero. What does it mean this? So grad v square, think of the graph of v being an elastic membrane. Then grad v square is essentially the linear elastic energy of the membrane. And the term plus v is the gravitational energy of the membrane if you think the gravitational constant to be one. And so you are minimizing, so you have elastic energy. So you want the membrane to be to have as little elastic energy as possible, but with the force, gravitational force acting of it, so the gravitational force is pushing the membrane down, but there is an obstacle below, let's say a table, a flat table. So the membrane cannot cross the table, therefore V greater or equal than zero. So the table is last, would be XM plus one equals zero. And so, uh, sorry, oops, no, I went, yeah. And so uh, that's how you get the, the non-negativity constraint. So the picture is on the right. You see, if you take a minimizer of this problem, this is exist and unique because it's a com nice convex minimization problem. Um, and um, you, the minimizer, would solve exactly the, prop, the, the PD I wrote on the top. So this is why we call this opt obstacle problem. Okay, so uh, what can we say about you? So first of all, the best you can prove is that the Hessian is bounded. This is optimal, the boundedness of the Hessian, because notice that the Laplacian 
of u is the jumps between z, the zero set and the positive set. In, where u is zero, the Laplacian is zero. Where u is positive, the Laplacian is one. So Laplacian being discontinuous, in particular, Hessian discontinuous. So the best you can hope for is Hessian to, to be bounded. And that's exactly what we have. Second, um, if you take a free boundary point, so uh, a, bound, a point on the boundary of u zero, that's the picture, and you look at the size of u in a ball of radius r, what you can prove is that u behaves like r square. So this means that roughly u behaves like a parabola, you can think morally. So where u is zero, like on the left, well, that's what it is. But then as u grows on a ball of radius r, the supremum behaves like r square. So this, this is uh, the picture we should have in mind, that u behaves like a parabola, grows like a parabola in the direction where let's say, away from the free boundary. So these are the two basic properties of solutions. And starting from this, we would like to say something about the free boundary. How do we do that? This is, we will use a blow up technique. So what you do is that you rescale your solution by zooming in. So let's say I have you in a ball of radius R around the free boundary point. I change variables. So I translate and dilate the variables. So that instead of having u in a small ball, I have a new function, but in a ball of radius one. Uh, notice that I divided by r square. Uh, there is a, a very practical reason to do that because if you compute the Laplacian of ux zero r, this will still be one where ux zero r is positive, and then where u is zero, ux zero r is zero is zero. So ux zero r is still a solution to the obstacle problem. So this is the scaling that preserves the equation, preserves the problem, okay? So dividing by R square is really what preserves the, the PD. But the nice thing about the scaling is the following. If you take UX zero R and you take two derivatives, you see, every, if you differentiate twice, you get R square coming out because you have an R in front of X. And so you, you get that the Hessian, uh, yeah, the second formula, the action of u x zero r is the same as the action of u at a different point, but I told you the action of u is bounded. Um, also, of course, u x zero r is uh, zero at the origin. And by the property I told you before, the supremum of u x zero r in a ball of radius one is one. This is because you remember u in a ball of radius r was like, the supremum was like r square. Now I divide by r square, so I get one. So this family of function u x zero r are function that vanish at the origin, their supremo is of size one, and they have bounded action uniformly. So you have very nice compactness properties. For instance, they are C1 compact in C1. You can take limits. You just take, I mean, accumulation points. They exist, and this is what we call blow up. And so blow ups are every possible limit of this sequence. And the question is, can we characterize them? Uh, if we could characterize them, then we could try to say something about u backward, because in some sense, these blow ups are telling us how u behaves infinitesimally around the free boundary point. So if we say something about the infinitesimal behavior, we can, you know, hope to say something back about the original function. That's not trivial. Um, so let's talk about what we expect as blow ups. So when you do a blow up, you can try to do reverse engineering. So let's try to guess what kind of blow ups I can get. Let's assume that I have around a free boundary point and let's assume the free boundary point is super nice. So I have a nice interface, very smooth, that passes through X zero. U is positive on the right, U is zero on the left. Now I'm gonna look at the function U. Again, from the side, I expect something like a, a parabola on one side, zero on the other. And as I zoom in and I zoom in, this interface, the free boundary will become flat because it's, I'm assuming it to be a nice smooth surface. So as I zoom in and zoom, I will get something flat. So in the limit, I will get a, a half space. So in the limit, I expect to see that the zero set of U becomes a half space. And then in the positivity set, because the zero set is a half space, so it's a, it's a set that is invariant under n minus one direction, I would expect the limit to depend only on one variable, which is the variable orthogonal to the half space. And then if you have a one-dimensional solution, you can easily check what it is because it's a simple OD to solve. And you just get a, a parabola in the positivity set. 
So if you are around a very nice free boundary point, in the limit, what you expect to see is something like the one I wrote, one half e dot x positive part square, which is a half parabola. Um, so this, as I say, is reverse engineering. It's like if the free boundary were smooth and nice, that's what I expect to see. Let's use this as a definition. I will say that x0 is a regular point if up to a subsequence, I see this half space solution, one half space solution as a possible blow up. Okay, that's one. What else can I see? Well, let's assume that the free boundary looks like this now. So something where the positivity set is very large and u is zero, u, where well, u is equal to zero is very, very small. As I zoom in, this set u equals zero becomes thinner and thinner and the limit will be aligned. And then I expect to see now two parabolas, one on each side. So it's just a global parabola, in fact, in RN. In two dimensions, you can have one alpha e dot x squared. If you are in higher dimension, you can do more complicated pictures. So that zero set could look like, so in two dimension, the zero set, it will be a line. But if you're in three dimension, it could be a plane or it could still be a line because the geometry is more complicated and so on in higher dimension. So more in general, inspired by this, the, the, by this picture, you could say, well, singular points are those where the free boundary, the, where the contact set, the set equal zero, disappear in the limit. So it disappears in the sense it has measured zero. And if it has measured zero, you expect to see quadratic polynomials like in this picture. So you just say, okay, I think that the natural thing to see when I don't have contact set anymore in the limit is to see a quadratic polynomial. So I expect to see that the blow up is P of X of the form one half AXX. This polynomial should be non-negative because U is non-negative. So the limit will be non-negative. And the, the, remember the question, Laplacian of U equal one where you are positive. So Laplacian P should be one uh, almost everywhere. And this means trace of A equal one. So the two conditions, A non-negative and trace of A equal one comes just from the non-negativity of U and the PD for you. Maybe there is more. Well, so first of all, um, well, the, the, maybe there is more and uh, this is not the case. So the, there is a very important theorem by Caffarelli. This is a famous theorem in 1977. He said, what uh, Luis proved is the following. So let's assume that I have a free boundary point then one of these two alternatives hold. Either zero is regular. So we are at a regular point. Remember regular means there exists a subsequence which converge to a half space solution. So if there exists one subsequence which does that, then in reality, the free boundary is analytic in a neighborhood, which in particular means uh, is super nice. Then every subsequence will, every sequence will converge to subsequence will converge to a half space solution. There is a unique half space solution and blah, 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 blah. I mean, the free boundary is as nice as you can hope for. Um, or zero is singular. So nothing else can happen from my, I, I gave you two definitions. They were not clearly mutually exclusive and the, Sorry, they were not clearly satisfying all possible pictures. Maybe there were more complicated things that could happen. No, that's not the case. Caffarelli proved you can only see regular and singular. Uh, and if you're singular, then the free boundary, what he proved is that it becomes very, very flat. Let me draw a picture. This is the second picture you see. He said that if you take, if you look at the free boundary in a ball of values R, there exists some unit direction ER that may depend on R such that the free boundary is trapped in a little of, little of our neighborhood of a plane. And this is the picture, right? So you see that the free boundary is very thin around a fixed plane. The plane possibly depending on R. That's what he proved Lewis in 77. So from this theorem, you see the regular set is very nice. The free boundary is analytic there, fantastic, not much to say. The singular one, well, that's exciting, right? Because it's strong, but still many things are not answered, I will say, at this level. Uh, for instance, this plane that depends on, on R, well, it looks suspicious. Um, so this was 77. So now we focus on singular points, and I told you, as I said, a priori, this direction may depend on R, not so nice. And also, 
what about this little OVAR? Can we say something a bit more precise? Can we better understand really the shape of the free boundary around singular points? So um, let me define to be sigma the set of singular points. This is just the definition. And then I will unify in a theorem something that was first proved by Caffarelli and Riviere in, in dimension two. Then there was a very major improved improvement on Caffarelli Riviere result by Sakai in 91 still in dimension two. This is based on complex analysis techniques. And then finally, Caffarelli generalized the result to every, generalized what I'm gonna say now to every dimension in, in dimension, um, to every dimension, so every end. So what has been proved is the following, that the limit of, if you're at a singular point and you look the blow up, the limit exists. So a priori from 77, you didn't know that the limit could depend on may depend on the subsequence. This was not excluded. Instead, there is really a limit at every singular point that there exists a unique quadratic polynomial, P star, depending on X zero. In addition, this polynomial depends continuously on the singular point. So if you have two singular points which are close, the quadratic polynomial are close. And out, as a consequence, Caffarelli showed that the singular set is contained in a C1 and minus one dimensional manifold, okay? So this is uh, optimal. One can build examples to see that this is optimal. But uh, so the, the core here is that out of an information on the blow up of you, so on the behavior of you, as expected, you can say something about the free boundary, in particular about the singular set. So if you want to understand the geometry of the singular set, you need to say something very precise about you. Here, if you look at the statement, what Caffarelli is proving is essentially saying that the U is, uh, in an informal sense, is like saying U is C1, is C2 at singular points. Because this P star represents like the second order Taylor expansion of U, it's a quadratic polynomial. And it's telling you that the second order Taylor expansion of U at every singular point is continuous with respect to the base. So it's like saying that the function is C2 uh, on a closed set. So one has to take this with the right definitions. Um, but, and then as a consequence, it got sigma containing C1 manifold. So the comment that I would like to emphasize is exactly this. So from a quadratic convergence, you converge into a polynomial like a little of R, a sort of C2 regularity, it got that the singular set is C1. Well, containing C1 manifolds, that's what I mean by C1. In particular, if you, if one could prove a higher convergence rate of U to P star, then one will get stronger regularity of sigma, okay? So this is just, just a, this is a very simple thing to check. One just has to repeat Caffarelli's proof and say, assume that instead of having little over square, one has R to the two plus alpha, and that will be enough to, to do, um, you know, um, to get a higher regularity. So this is the remark I wanted to make. And now in this direction to, you know, to, to, to get higher regularity, there was a very important result by Georg Weiss. So in 99, Weiss found a, uh, what is now the, um, referred to as Weiss monotonicity formula. And this is what he proved. Let n be two, so in the plane, then the, the convergence of u to p star is of the order r to the two plus alpha for some alpha depend for some universal alpha. In particular, sigma is contained as c1 alpha curve. Okay. So what Georg managed to do here was exactly to you know improve the rate of convergence and then get extra information on the singular set. Um, if one looks at the proof of Weiss, it's very interesting. Uh, most of this proof works in every dimension. There is no two-dimensional aspect in it. There is only one, point, one key point, I would say, where at some moment it really needs two dimension. Uh, I asked him about that at some moment. Uh, and in fact, he, he was rather uh, upset in the sense that he, he felt that maybe I mean, he didn't see at the moment why n equal two was so crucial, besides that he couldn't make it work in either dimension. Um, so 
is, at the end he was satisfied with this 2D result. It's a beautiful result. Uh, but of course, the, the question remained, can you do something in higher dimension? I mean, is there something one could do with this method? Uh, this has been done recently, in uh, roughly now, well, four years ago, by Colombo, Spoler, Spoler and Verichkov. So in a very interesting paper, what they did, there was a step where Weiss was using two dimension, and this, this was based also that, on the fact that he was using some compactness argument. And so he could make things work only in 2D. Uh, then instead they made Colombo, Spoiler, and Verichkov, they made the argument quantitative. So they, they never use compactness. They, they, there is a moment where, okay, for people who are used to it, is they, they use kind of a, the approach is based on some sort of perimetric approach. And instead of doing some, to get some inequality by compactness, they really did it by end, com constructing suitable competitors in some minimization problem. And they, in that way, they could go to higher dimension. So okay, they got the result, they got an estimate in dimension three and greater, and greater equal than three. And this is the result they got, that you convert to a polynomial with a logarithmic rate. So quadratically plus a log. So they could only improve the little law of R square by a log epsilon factor, okay? So they couldn't get a power. Uh, and then, of course, as a corollary, you get that the, the single, single set is containing a C1 log epsilon manifold, which means C1, where the modulus of continuity of the, of the normal is logarithmic. Um, the result, as I say, is extremely nice and very, very uh, interesting. The approach also is very elegant. Of course, one may wonder now, okay, you extend it to higher dimension, but the price to pay is this log. I mean, you didn't, there is no power. Um, how, how comes, how optimal is that? Okay, at the, uh, okay, it was done more or less at the same time, uh, but let's say published one year later. What we did with Joachim Serra was actually to prove a not different result where we managed to show that the singular set is actually C11. So not C1 log, not C1 alpha, C11 but up to a co-dimension three set. So the, the spirit of our theorem was different. We said, okay, wait, we don't want to prove a, theory, a, a regularity result for the single set everywhere where we accept to give up some points. Perhaps there are points which are really nested in the single set. What we, we gave a name to them, we call them anomalous points where so they're singular, but they're also anomalous among the singular. So the singular point in general actually are very nice. And uh, instead, it, there are points which are really anomalous and annoying. And so um, just to explain you how we got this and what is the spirit. So the, what we prove to get C11, well, I, I told you before, if you want to get C1 alpha, you get you need, to, you need to prove a rate R to the two plus alpha. So if you want C11, you need cubic. And then we prove generically that that's true. So at most points, so generically by here, generically means at most points up to co-dimension three, you have a cubic convergence. Uh, notice that cubic is optimal for this rate because even if you gave me a infinity function, well, after you subtract the quadratic polynomial, the, 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 the rate you, the best rate you can hope for is to see is cubic because the, the cubic is the next order term in the Taylor expansion. So at this level, this estimate is optimal. So generically, you get the best estimate you will get for you. Um, in two dimension, you see n minus three is negative, <laughs> it's less than zero. Uh, so in two dimension, there is no anomalous point. So in two dimension, actually you get cubic at every point. So vice result, it had a two plus alpha, the alpha is one in dimension two at every point. Uh, and then uh, we also recover a Colombo polar Verichkov. In our analysis, we actually prove at the same time the C11, but the C1 log epsilon, we got it as part of our analysis. But I think what is even more interesting is that the n minus one dimension, n minus three dimensional bound is sharp. What do I mean by that? It means that if n is three, so you have the obstacle problem in dimension three, there exists, a, you, can buy, you can build an example that's what we did in the paper, an example of a solution to the obstacle problem where there is one singular point where the rate of convergence is like logarithmic. 
So, okay, we didn't prove logarithmic, we just proved that there is no, is not two plus alpha, is never two plus alpha for any alpha. So you, if you give me any alpha positive, the rate cannot be two plus alpha. I think if one work a bit more our example, one could prove that it has to be log logarithmic. But the point, uh, the philosophy here is that the, the theorem of color, Colombo's Paul and Velichkov is actually sharp in some sense. That is sharp, modulo powers of the log. In the sense that in dimension three and higher, you cannot hope to prove two plus alpha at, at every point. So their theorem was very, you know, point wise. They say, fix a free boundary point, I have that. What we say is that you cannot hope to get, if you want a theorem which is true at every point, C1 log is the best you can get. This log is the best you can get. However, if you are willing to give up some points which are lower dimensional, then you can get higher rates. So this is what we did. Uh, I will comment towards the end that there have been generalization. Perhaps I will first speak of what we did and then there have been generalization by this, for in particular by a couple of PhD students. Uh, here at ETH and the uh, University of Zurich, um, where they working on, I mean, they improved, uh, they worked on these techniques, they improved them and they could get way better results by now. Um, but now let me try to move to the, to the generic part, which is a bit different. Now I want to explain what I want. So we, the philosophy in that paper with Joachim is that I think we understood two things. First of all, we understood how to, to, to get this cubic rate. Uh, the, the, um, one of the key tools, again, I say words, I don't want to be technical in this talk, but uh, one of the key things we realized that Algram frequency formula, which is a tool which is very classical, for instance, geometry measure theory in several problems, works very well even in this problem. So that's, inform that's tool one, frequency formula. This is what allows you to analyze rates, how human P behaves at the next order. Uh, tool two, if you blow up, if you look at limits, if you do blow, next order blow ups, so you take U minus P, you normalize by size and you look at possible accumulation points of U minus P divided by the size, whatever, choose a size, itself to norm or whatever, they will, they will have, there is compactness, you will get limits and these limits are connected to the Signorini problem, which is the lowest dim lower dimension obstacle problem. So by knowing properties of Signorini, you can say things about this. Uh, tool three, geometry measure theory, uh, and let's say dimension reduction arguments. Uh, since in dimension two, there are no anomalous points, you get that uh, the, the first, you jump in dimension. So the first dimension where something can happen is dimension three, so if in dimension three, you have a point, in dimension N, you have a N minus three dimensional sets. So there are these, these theorems in, um, based on what is called federal reduction argument that tells you that if you have some one, point, one bad point in dimension three, then if you're in dimension N, the set of bad points gonna be, is gonna be dimension N minus three. So you can estimate the size of bad points by knowing the first dimension where they exist. So there is a, an interplay between um, PDs and geometric measure theory. So I would say these are the three uh, macro tools behind this, this, this result with Joachim Serra. Now, given that, uh, in a C1 project with Serra and Rossoton, we thought, okay, let's try now to analyze a different problem. So we go back to the obstacle problem. Remember that there are boundary conditions F. And now the question is, okay, well, what can we say about the singular points? So in 1974, Schaeffer conjectured the following. For generic F, the singular sense should be empty. Uh, the conjecture is written in kind of a very informal way. So in particular, it's not very clear what is generic, for instance. What does it mean generic F? But I don't know, you can interpret like, okay, I have the obstacle problem. Perhaps I could have singular points that arise in the free boundary. But if I perturb the boundary data in some sense, this, free, this singular point should disappear. And in general, I should not see them. Very well. So uh, this conjecture was solved by Regis Monod in dimension two, uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so with Joachim and uh, Serra and Xavier Soton, we thought, okay, maybe now that we are starting to understand better the solution of the obstacle problem, perhaps we can hope to say something here. But to prove a theorem, 
we need first to properly define what is generic. So the way we do it is the following. We take, uh, so we want to perturb the boundary data. We are gonna do it in one direction because it's convenient mathematically. Of Anyhow, the theorem we will get is the, from the generic point of view is gonna be the strongest you can get. Uh, so we perturb a bit the boundary data by lifting them. So we say, take a one parameter family of boundary data and assume that they, they are not trivial, which means that where let's say the boundary datum is positive, the time derivative is also strictly positive. So this is just to prevent that maybe f of t is constant in, in, in t, which then will be uh, you know, a trivial variation. So you cannot prove anything if you're not really moving stuff. Uh, then you define u subscript t to be the solution with boundary data f subscript t. And um, why we like this, there is a reason because for n equal two, this corresponds to the what's called the initial flow. So u of t will be the interval of the pressure. So the interesting part is that if we say something about this one parameter family of solutions, we actually can say something about the initial flow. So as a side effect. So it's like, you know, um, what is two birds with one stones, right? So it's a sense you are setting a formulation which allows you to study at the same time Schaeffer conjecture, but as when specified to n equal two, we'll say something about the issue. Um, so what we say is that let's take sigma t, the, the set of singular point for the solution ut, okay? So we have this, for each t, we have the set of singular points of ut, okay? So now we have a one parameter family, uncountable many singular sets. And then we take the union. So our strategy is to say, let's put everything together. So we have this one parameter family of solutions. The solutions are ordered because the boundary data are ordered and by maximum principle, they're gonna be ordered. So you have this kind of foliation of the space made by solutions depending on T. And then in the, in the, in the base inside Omica, you will have this one parameter family of singular sets. Okay, then what we could prove is the following. There, take the union of all singular sets. There exists a subset sigma star, which has the following property. Sigma star is very large inside sigma. Notice that sigma a priori could be huge because it's an uncountable union of sets that morally should, could, that each of them could have dimension m minus one. So a priori sigma star, sigma could be huge. Inside this possibly huge set, up to removing a set of co-dimension two, what we do, or dimension n minus two, what we say is the following. So if you are in sigma star, so sigma star is like the set of points where things go well. And let's say that zero is a free boundary point for sigma t zero. So it's a free boundary point for a certain solution, t zero. Then we can expand the solution up to order five, essentially. So we can keep going in the expansion that we did with Joachim um, up to order five. So this gives a very precise information on how you behave around such a singular point. Now, of course, I will, a natural question that could be is like, why do you stop at five? Um, can you go further? Uh, yes, so we stopped at five and I will tell you in a second because for us going to five or writing 100 would not have changed the final result. And it was easier for us to stop at five. So by our method, it was, we found a method that made it rather easy to stop at five. If you wanted to go higher, it would have been way more involved. And then any higher power we got would be useless for our conclusion. So then we stopped at five. Can you go on? Yes, by now, yes. Uh, for instance, our PhD student uh, between here and uh, University of Zurich, they did it. And you could go to infinity in reality. But we didn't do it, it wasn't so important. So you can even think that here we, one can get a infinity expansion. So sigma star could be the set of points. So you're saying that among the singular points up to remove this n minus two dimensional set, you can expand to infinity your, uh, your solution. Okay, and here is the interesting conclusion. As a consequence, I tell you the following thing that, um, so you have the singular point. At, so, sing, so the origin is a singular point. Now you look a bit in the future. So you look a bit what happens in the future. And what I claim is that 
if you go up in the future by a little increment t, so this t written there is like a small time increment. So just think of t as super small, a small increment in time. Then there are no singular points in a ball of radius t one over four minus epsilon. So the, okay, four minus epsilon comes because it's five minus epsilon minus one. So let's say if you had proven expansion to order 100, you would have gotten here one over 99. So you get very quick. So what you're saying, so the higher the power, this ball is t to a power less than one. And the smaller the power, the larger the ball. So you're saying if there is a singular free boundary point at the origin where I can expand my solution up to almost infinity, then if I go a bit in the future, and ask myself how many points there are after a, a certain increment of time, how many singular points there are in a certain ball? Well, there are no singular points and the resource of the ball is extremely large compared to the time because this T is a, is a negative power. So it's a, sorry, the power less than one. So it's, this radius is huge compared to T. So you, in, a, in a kind of sc in a scaling, like you're going very little up in time and the radius is growing way, way faster in terms of, uh, speed. So what we are trying to do in this, in the spirit of this work is to try to relate the singular points of these certain solutions. We want to say if one certain solution, UT0, has some behavior, then we can say something about all the singular points in the future. And then it's like of a covering argument to make all the solutions talk to each other. So what, what the philosophy is that each solution influences the other. And something we know about one solution will say something about the singular set of someone else. And then you start to combine all this information with covering arguments to estimate how many singular points you can have. So this was one part, but what about other points? Here you have N minus two uh, in sigma minus sigma star. What we said here would not be enough for the final theorem. So uh, we need actually a very precise description of sigma minus sigma star up to dimension three. So the N minus two there, is too large. If you want to prove that you are gonna state in a second, you need to say something about N minus three. So you need to go from N minus two to N minus three, which means you still need to describe more points there. In particular, there are some points you want to describe. Um, so philosophically, you have to think that here, you see here, the polynomial you're looking at is like one half E dot X square, so if you forget the, the, the next top term of the expansion, the set u equals zero is a hyperplane because it's e dot x equals zero, okay? So in dimension n, where the expansions, the symphony expansion I'm telling you happens around singular points where the zero set is a hyperplane. Now you could say, okay, let's think in dimension three. Suppose that my zero set is not a, a plane, but it's a line. So the singular set is like, uh, uh, you know, a very thin set around a line in dimension three. What can I say? So these points are not part of this statement because if the zero set looks like a line, I don't expect to see this expansion because the, the, the zero set of you there looks completely different. So what can I say? These points will be in the, in the remaining part, will be outside sigma star. Around this point, the, the, what is impressive is that you have no symphony expansion. After, actually, you have no C2 alpha expansion. This, is a, this goes back to what I told you about the theorem with Joachim, uh, Sarah, the one uh, in 2019. We can find anomalous points in dimension three and higher. So there are points where the expansion stops at two. You cannot prove two plus alpha for any alpha. So, there is a big dichotomy in the singular set. So there are some points where you can go to infinity. There are some points where you have to stop at two and there is nothing more you can do. And you need to analyze them differently. And then perhaps there are way more points, but at least all the others that where you start to not know even how they look like, we can prove that they are co-dimension three inside this set sigma. Uh, and then the corollary is the Schaeffer conjecture in dimension four. Actually, we proved something more general. We proved that in every dimension, the singular set generically, so for almost every time, has dimension n minus four. Okay, as code, sorry, uh, sorry, as Hausdorff dimension, as Hausdorff measure, as, uh, as, 
n minus four dimensional house door measure equals zero, which means that if you are in dimension four, this set is empty for almost everything. Uh, so why so why this is the strongest generality you can have? Because you see, if you're in dimension four and you tell me that the singular set for almost everything is zero, it means the following: you take your free boundary, you perturb it a bit, and automatically all singular points will disappear. Just move it infinitesimal in time because for almost every t you will see no singular point. But then if you have no singular set for a certain solution, you will have no singular set in a neighborhood because the regular points are stable. So which means that if the singular set is empty for a certain t, it's empty in a neighborhood. So the set of points actually is an open set of full measure. So this, from this statement it looks like that you have only the back measure, full the back measure, but not only in reality, the set of good times in dimension three, four and lower is also open. So the bad times are, have measure zero and they're closed. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. I think I'm, yeah, I'm on time. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, please. Let thank me. you very much, Alessio. It was very, very clear, very deep results. I think and now some questions can be put. So, uh, okay, uh, Alessia, um, I have a question. Uh, in the uh, beginning of your talk, you, sa you said that um, a sigma uh, belongs to the C, uh, uh, to smooth uh, manifold uh, uh, of dimension n minus one. Yeah, yep. uh, but what is uh, what does it mean that it belongs? Uh, it coincides with this uh, 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 manifold up to some uh, le less uh, dimension set. Uh, yeah, uh, formally uh, the word that it belongs uh, doesn't prevent of, uh, anything. Yeah, right. So no, no, no. It, it doesn't coincide. So. It's possible to construct examples, uh, even in the plane. So m minus one will be line. Uh, okay, let, let me be precise here because, of course, uh, one could be. Uh, it depends really what you are looking at. So let me be, let me go back a second. Um, I uh, sometimes I cheat and I don't cheat. What do I mean by here? So the also problem I stated is with Laplacian of u equal one. Okay. So if Laplacian U is really one, one is not any number, is a, is a constant, which is analytic in particular. So for instance, if you are in the plane and you look really what you can prove with analytic right hand side, you get better results. So uh, in reality, you can prove way better than what I said. That's what Sakai did in 91. Everything I say today is very robust in the sense that if you give me, instead of putting one, you put a smooth right hand side. Mm -hmm. You could repeat everything I said. Every theorem I said it works. So you don't need one. One is really special, okay? Because it's analytic. Yes. So uh, there is like an like a if the right hand side is CK, then you can prove all my theorems with expansions up to the right K. Depend. I mean, up to a J, which depends on K, maybe K plus one or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is that there is really a natural PD uh, scaling. So in this spirit, so if you accept that the right hand side may not be one, but could be infinity perhaps, mm -hmm. then in the plane, even in the plane, you can build an example of um, contact set where the singular set is counter inside a line. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you can start to play with uh, and just build a, a solution to the obstacle problem, which is going to have a singular points on a counter set on a line. Uh -huh. Okay and nothing better, right? And then you will have, uh, so then the singular set is a counter inside the line, the line is infinity, but the, the singular points are just a counter. And uh, this is not even too difficult. I mean, essentially this is based only on, on some uh, kind of extension theorem. First you build a contact set, and then locally if the contact set is super nice, like uh, you can try to build a infinity solution outside by sort of with reconstruction. Um, with infinity right inside. With analytic, you cannot do because it's much more rigid, of course. 
and analyticity that doesn't allow to play with counter sets, uh, but you could do it. So that's why the containment is really optimal. Uh, you can never say something exactly about these regular points, how many they are. So the, this uh, contained in C1 uh, here, yeah, that's the best you can do in general. But then the spirit of our theorem for instance, generosity is telling you, okay, but you see, one thing which is annoying of this theorem is that, so we are in a REN. So the boundary of our n-dimensional domain is n minus one dimensional. So the regular points are n minus one dimensional. And now here I'm saying the singular point are containing a C1 n minus one dimensional manifold. So single and regular at this level have the same size. They're both n minus one dimensional. And you can, you can build examples where they are the same size. But generically, that's not true. If you perturb a bit, you get at least co-dimension four with respect to that. That's, I think, also the spirit. So singular points are, yeah, you can build examples artificially, but you perturb a bit the data and singular points are super small. I hope this clarifies a bit. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or? I see a raised hand. Yes, one for question. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Um, my question relates, I think that usually here there are problems also with the parabolic type equations. The, could your um, uh, approach be extended also there? I think you analyzed this in previous works, but this is, I think, for elliptic, right? Right, so we have uh, another paper uh, where we studied the parabolic obstacle problem. Uh, not generic, just, uh, you know, it will be a kind of the analog of <clears throat> the work with the Serra, the first one. So we just, you have DT, uh, so instead of Laplacian U equal characteristic, you have Laplacian U minus DT U equal characteristic. So you replace the heat equation. So this is, will be like the one phase Stefan problem. Um, what can you do? So <laughs> when we started to, to do the Stefan problem, we thought naively, oh, we understood the elliptic, let's do the parabolic because it's gonna be the same. Um, well, not really. Uh, what happened is this, that uh, up to the theorem with Serra, uh, so this one, generically you get cubic. That's true also for the parabolic. So it is beautiful parallel. You have the right uh, Algram frequency formula for parabolic, you would buy, and you get this cubic expansion. So the parabolic level, you get exactly this at, uh, um, without too much difficulty, I would say. Now, the problem is what about the rest? Because the, the, to go further in every kind of this theorem, you, you, the key point is to go further in the expansion. So the analog will be this expansion. So can you do an expansion like infinite expansion in the, in the Stefan problem. So this expansion, I told you, is based on the idea that you have Algram frequency formula. So there are formulas, monotonicity formula that allows you to keep going in the expansion and get higher, higher and higher orders. Now for Stefan, that's just false, up to the order three. So after you get reach cubic, that's false. And the reason is the following. So in the, in the elliptic, there is no time, right? So you can get like a singular set, which is super, super tiny. And then you have a nice uh, expansion. For instance, think of the solution, parabo the, a parabola. There is contact set is measured zero. And then the parabola is a symphony expansion because well, all the terms are zero after the quadratic term. In Stefan, even if at, let's say the singular, there is no contact set at a certain time, in the past, there is contact set because what's happening, the model is like thinking of ice melting. So if at, in the, at certain time I have zero set, in the past, I will have two fronts of contact set that meet. So it's like I have a block of ice, at, let's say a block of ice inside two planes that start to move parallel until they touch. The block of ice in the past is a, is a thick slab, okay? Yeah. Which has a, a definite measure which means that how, much, how far I am from being caloric, because everything is based on the fact that the, the contact set should not bother too much, right? You have heat equation equal right hand side. You, bless you. Uh, should I interrupt you? I'm very sorry. Yeah. I think uh, part of your answer is already contained in Rosaton talk to a couple of days ago, and it's almost the topic of another, another it's talk. I, I'm very sorry, but oh yeah, yeah. no, no, yeah. sorry. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't yeah, I know if uh, you what. <laughs> I see, uh, yeah, yeah I take it too much waiting. time. I think we should respect more or less the schedule. We are already a little late. 
I think oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. is in fact the matter of a new talk because it's a very, very delicate issue. In fact, I have also myself a question to you, but I'm waiting until until you come to Portugal next time. Okay. <laughs> <I'll put laughs> oh, yeah. where you come. Thank you very much. I think we should yeah. thank also Alessio for this.